Good afternoon, everyone, and a huge welcome to UCD's Human Health Impact and Technology Series, where we speak to cutting edge health and technology innovators from across the world. My name is Professor Patricia McGuire, and I'll be your host for this series. The format is that each speaker and I will have a five minute chat together, and then we will open up the dialogue to the audience. So please do remember to submit your questions. Today, I have the honor of introducing you to Professor Walter Kulch. And Walter is the Director of Systems Biology Ireland and the Precision Oncology Ireland Consortium Lead. And I will speak to him about precision oncology and developing digital twins of cancer patients. Welcome, Walter, to the series. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Great pleasure to be here. Lovely to have you on, Walter. And the first question I have for you today is Systems Biology Ireland and UCD is now one of the biggest largest cancer research centers in Europe. Can you give us a quick summary of the research that's underway? Yeah. So, Systems Biology is really a discipline which was born out of the fact that we now can produce so many data. And the bottleneck really has shifted from producing data to understanding them. So what systems biology does is using computer models and mathematical models to analyze biological data. And we're very lucky to have both wet labs where we can do biological experiments as well as computation under one roof. So we can build models, but also then test the models in the lab. And that's a big advantage. And uh, most of our institute is working on cancer. And in particular, we have a big program on childhood cancer. And this is really where we're trying to establish what we call digital twin. And digital twin means computer models of cancer patients, where we on the computer in silico can simulate how a tumor arises, how the tumor progresses, how it metastasizes, how it responds to therapy, how it becomes resistant, and what we can do about it. Um, and the idea is in the long term, it's, this is all highly experimental at the moment, but the idea in the long term is that we actually really can do this in the clinic, that instead of giving the patient drugs right away, that we would optimize the treatment on the computer and optimize this to each individual patient so that we can give the best therapy, the optimized therapy to each individual patient. So that's really the um, gist of it, but there's a lot of research involved, as you can imagine, in order to get there. And I can imagine that there's so many questions about that. So please do remember to submit your questions if you have any for Walter. But Walter, I want to ask you: September is Childhood Cancer Awareness Month, and I suppose what I've learned from it is that we are fantastic at curing childhood cancer, but there's less awareness about the long-term effects of the actual treatment. And maybe you could tell us a little bit about this. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So fortunately, we've become really good in uh, treating children with cancer very well, and we have very high cure rates approaching 80-90% in, in most cancers. However, it comes as a high cost because what we're doing, the mainstay of childhood cancer therapy is chemotherapy, which is genotoxic. It damages the genome. And you can imagine when you damage the genome of small children or babies, there will be long-term side effects. And the list is incredibly long and dramatic. So you can have secondary tumors, hearing loss, infertility, cardiotoxicity, and the list goes on and on. So the big challenge now is maintaining the high cure rates, but reducing the toxicities. And again, this is something where uh, the digital twin comes in because we also can model side effects, right? And we can anticipate which side effects will, aff will affect which patient and then try to sort of optimize the therapy so it still maintains the efficacy, but the side effects are reduced. And we are currently working very hard with uh, our fantastic colleagues in the Grumman Children Hospital um, uh, on a clinical study, which is rolling out where we develop digital twins uh, in parallel to genome sequencing. So we have a clinical arm at, uh, where the genome sequencing is used, like it's nowadays used in the clinic to look at genetic changes. But then we also develop the digital twin models and we sort of can monitor then in real time what will happen, you know, whether our models are accurate enough and we can improve our models. And hopefully in three, four or five years time, this actually will then become a tool which clinicians can use. 
and and is that is that rolling out in criminal hospital water that's so exciting it is, yes yes so we are starting it actually this month and this is a really exciting it has been in in preparation for many years now and it's really exciting to actually you know see it happening and it's uh, really a huge team effort you know with um, our clinical colleagues and uh, there's all of uh, also uh, philanthropy involved and um, companies who provide us the reagents for sequencing and doing the sequencing so it's uh, hugely exciting and uh, a team effort in all aspects it's incredible and i'm also with so many questions coming in for you so please do remember to submit your questions so i can get through them all before the end and um, but walter someone's asking about um digital twin research in the u.s on pancreatic cancer maybe maybe you could tell us about that sorry i didn't understand the question oh i i'm sorry so somebody's asking about um your digital twin research in that's taking place right now on pancreatic cancer i don't know is that correct Oh, yeah, yeah. We also, the main emphasis in is uh, childhood cancer, but we're also developing digital twins for pancreatic cancer and ovarian cancer and other cancers because the the computer models are generic, right? So it's, it's like a, a computer where you put different softwares on. So once we have the framework, we can run that framework for, for various different types of cancer. And we do have actually a trial in the States, which is running since... Um, 2021 and pancreatic cancer, where we use a digital twin model to uh, recommend therapies. And that trial is currently ongoing. That's incredible. So, uh, so there's so many questions, Walter. I'm just so, so there's a lovely compliment here from you from Martin Kenny. He says, Thanks, Walter. It's great to hear about the brilliant work being done using the mathematical modeling and systems approaches. And he has two questions for you. So I'll, I'll, I'll ask one anyway. Can you also model cancer reoccurrence at the site of metastasis? For example, bone metastasis at, arising after a cure of something like breast cancer? Yeah, so this is actually one of the areas where we're especially interested in because therapy resistance and relapse is, are the big problems in, in general in, in all the cancers. This is what patients die from. So we are very interested in trying to model this. Um, at the moment, we are not quite there yet because that re would require information, more information than we currently have. So what we can model at the moment is mechanisms of resistance. And what we cannot model yet is actually if there's a metastasis, where it exactly will go to. Yeah. Okay. And his second question, have you investigated if or how cancer therapies affect cancer progression? Do certain therapies have short-term positive effects, which then give rise to more aggressive cancer progression? Yeah, this is an extremely good point. And uh, in particular now with immunotherapies, you know, you often have this phenomenon with targeted therapies that there is an initial really good response and then a rapid progression. Um, for this type, uh, we really ideally would need more data in later time points. And yeah. Uh, we actually have started um, not too long ago a clinical study with Austin Duffy at the Mater on pancreatic cancer where the patients have consented to also receive a biopsy at relapse. And that enables us then to actually to be much more precise about what the mechanisms of relapse are and why the relapse has occurred. So we need this type of longitudinal data to actually you know, model in detail what the relapse will look like. Yeah, because your digital twin, I suppose, is just a snapshot of time. Is that correct? And so you'd need to almost keep yeah. doing it to understand. Uh, yeah. So there's yeah, another I mean, question. At, the, at Sorry, the moment, we have a snapshot, right? So we are trying yeah. to look at a photograph and make a movie out of it. Yeah. That's a great analogy, actually. Yeah. Uh, there's another question, and actually, it's coming in from Jonah McKiernan, and he wants to know is, how is a digital twin defined exactly? For example, is it for genome? Do you look at DNA? Just DNA? Is it RNA? Is it protein abundance? Or how, how do you model your, your digital twin? Yeah, so the short answer is the more data, the better, and the more uh, complete we can do it. What we need at a minimum is uh, gene expression data um, okay. and uh, genome sequencing data. Ideally, we also would like proteomics data and metabolomics data. 
but we also include you know clinical history and we, we include existing biomedical knowledge which we can input in form of knowledge graphs you all if you use you know the internet you will have seen knowledge graphs on the on the internet which tell you you look at this and then you also likely will be looking at this so you can actually import existing knowledge in form of graphs into the model so we can um, we're not sort of living in thin air we are building on existing knowledge as well and and, and along those lines i suppose i'm uh, just uh, we've a couple of questions coming in around this idea of snapshot and making a movie so what about i suppose and there's a couple of questions around digital twins getting updated as we age i mean are you doing that are people actually doing that walter uh we are starting doing this uh I mean, the, the digital twin concept actually comes from engineering, you know, when engineers build complex machineries like an airplane or a car. But of course, they can monitor it every second or every every minute. So they can constantly update the models. Unfortunately, we don't have that luxury. But uh, what we can do, for instance, the long term vision would be that um, as you go to the doctor, as you, a patient is being treated, that this data will be fed back into the digital twin model so that it's constantly being updated. And that the model learns, you know, as the patient uh, goes through their life journey or goes through their uh, journey in the hospital during the treatment. So updating is important. And this is currently also a, a bottleneck because, you know, this is something what isn't sort of... Um, within the clinical routine it's not built in yet so yeah. i hope that changes yeah and, and and actually something else uh, people are asking about here is, is 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 you know this idea of changing therapies but it's something around um compliance to you know taking drugs and, and this idea of visualization yeah visualization is very important because i mean the if you look at what drives these digital twins, that's very abstract. These are mathematical equations, fairly complicated ones. And in order to actually make it palatable for a human mind, um, you need to visualize these complex things. And ideally, in the long term, um, we want this to be like an app on a phone, you know, where you can see for instance, the effects of the treatment, when you simulate the treatment, you would see your tumor shrinking or growing and you would sort of visualize actually what's what's happening in, in real time. Um, this is something what we are not doing on our own. So we collaborate uh, yeah. with, it, with uh, companies. <clears throat> so you could imagine that if you, you know, if you, if you wanted your patients to change their diet or, you know, something that would help them progress in, in, um, and help I suppose their disease prog progression that you could maybe visualize that is that correct? Yeah, for instance. So, I mean, if you think of visualization, there is really the sky is the limit. Um, you know, there's many ways how you can can visualize things. I mean, you can see, you know, your your weight going up and down or your blood sugar speed um, level going going up and down. And and I think this is much more effective, right? In particular, when you talk prevention, right? If if I show you a number probably doesn't make big impact but if i show you for instance your your blood sugar going up and your uh, blood vessels clogging up then that probably will be much more effect oh i think so, well, I very think much so. Used yeah. To visual cues yeah it is good for humans i suppose in a way um so walter we've, we've, we've it's been a fantastic speaking to you but i i'm just this is so exciting the development from your lab the, the, the different projects you're involved in um, across the world and academia and industry. But I suppose in general, you know, for you as, as one of the global thought leaders in the area of healthcare, what's the most exciting? What what does the future look like for you? I think what the most exciting is that we really can now get personal because medicine is all based on population studies. And what we do, we treat the average person. And unfortunately, only very few people are really average. You know, we're all a little bit different. And this is for the first time we really can precisely treat individuals. And uh, I'm originally trained as a medic. And, you know, for this, it's extremely exciting that you now can be 
Betsy and always have been tried to be personal because you have a personal relationship to the patient. But now we actually can be also personal in terms of the science, in terms of the science underlying the treatment and the diagnostic. So this is for me the most exciting aspect. It's, an, it's incredible, Andrew. Thank you so much. And, you know, um, digital training seems to make the risk of this personal. I'm actually sure wonderful. And, um, it's just such an exciting future ahead of us. And unfortunately, uh, we're getting lots of compliments in on the fact that we are completely out of time. So sincere apologies to all of you. These questions I did not get to. But I want to take this opportunity to say a huge, huge thank you to Walter for a stimulating conversation today. Thank you so much, Walter. Well, thank you. And thanks to all the wonderful collaborators we're having on this journey.